Right, hi. Um, my name is Simon, and today I want to talk to you about our experience with using SPEC. Now, to begin with, how many of you have kind of heard of or already looked at SPEC? Okay, almost everyone, fantastic. So I don't have to spend too much time going over the kind of details. Just to kind of briefly, um, Closure Spec is uh, based on the idea that we can actually have something like regular expressions, but for any kind of data. It's based on a lovely pa paper called Parsing with Dervitz. Dervitz and uh, I really re recommend you reading this paper. It's kind of easy to follow, not kind of very long, not overly, um, Opaque, opaque, so it's a very nice example of what I feel is a good computer science paper. Or um, there's also like another option which I highly recommend. Uh, this is this blog post which goes through in actual enclosure through an kind of interactive version of the main ideas of this paper. And it's kind of completely interactive, so you can interact with it online, and it's kind of great to get the, a feel of how things work uh, behind the scenes. Right now, so the kind of original. Um, intention for spec as um, as per closure web page is that uh, writing spec should enable us to do automatic validation, error reporting, destructuring, instrumentation, test data generation, and generative test generation. Now, um, and here, what we'll see in this talk is that also not only this, but there are also some other things you can use spec, and it works rather well in those situations as well. And I think like, the spec is one of those ideal examples of what's elegant in closure and how closure people, especially obviously which Hickey approach solving problems, meaning that it really is kind of distilled to its bare bones. And I love this quote by Eric Norman that says that composition is about decomposing. Now, when you first read it, it's kind of almost sounds banal, but the more you think about it, the more it's actually it's very profound. And that this is exactly what you could say is one of the guiding um, design principles behind closure, that we're always kind of looking at how to decompose what's in front of us to find what are those elements that really kind of then combine the solution back together. So removing only kind of unnecessary coupling and really finding the fundamental simplest bits and then building something on top of that. And closure spec is a great example of this thinking because kind of it starts with um, a, already a powerful idea of having kind of a description language for your data and then kind of decompose it. And in decomposing it, what we'll see is that it kind of it enables us to do a lot of very separate things which at first glance might don't even seem like they have a lot in common and yet they all can be done with spec. So it's a really great example of how closure as a language is also growing. Now, during kind of, as I promised, this talk is going to be like very concrete examples of using spec. Um, like immediately when spec came out, I kind of fell in love with it um, and decided to test it extensively. So basically, um, we went through the majority of our closure code base, which comprised about 15,000 lines of code, um, and applied spec to it. So our code is maybe not entirely representative of all the things you can do with Clojure because it's um, basically very heavily tilted towards um, doing analytics and data science. So what we have is we have our entire ETL pipeline, meaning all the kind of, uh, infrastructure to do with getting data from one, from one place to another in Transformit. Then we have various algorithms like some rich, uh, risk hedging algorithms, demand responsive pricing, packaging, routing, because we're in logistics. Um, and also we build most of our internal BI tools in Clojure and Clojure Script. So, but again, like I'm pretty certain that some of the things I'm going to talk about are, aren't quite as applicable if your kind of main use case is building, for instance, web applications with Clojure. So take this with a grain of salt that I'm kind of heavily based, and this is maybe not a super generic example, but um, it's still like, where I feel it has value is that it's still relatively large code base um, and actually something that's running in production. Also kind of, um, as a precursor, we were already before using schema for some of the things I'm not going to talk about how it's done in uh, spec. This is also why we were able to change over so quickly because some of the things we already kind of had an idea where we want to go with them uh, and kind of simplified. But and all during this talk, I'll also kind of try to do some comparison between like well, how things can be done in uh, schema or word in schema and what um, spec brings to the table. But, like 
ultimately going forward, I really kind of hoping that we as a community adopt spec over schema simply because it's obviously part of the language and also it's just kind of that little bit more generic and in that it allows you to do massively more things. So it kind of really makes sense to go all in on the spec. Right, so the first and kind of vanilla use case is obviously kind of validation. Now, um, one thing that kind of I wasn't sure about and at the beginning we went slightly overboard is where do you actually want to put your validation in terms of kind of code base? So in the end, what I think is kind of the best compromise is to find where the API boundaries of your applications, maybe something like library versus your actual domain code or whatever, and put validation there, but don't really just kind of put it everywhere because it just doesn't serve any kind of much purpose. Uh, one very nice thing, or something that's kind of looking very promising, although it's not really been exploited yet, at least not my knowledge, is that what spec also brings to the table are essentially structured errors. If something goes wrong, you have a, your description of what went wrong is data which you can interact with, which is a massive advantage over having, uh, for instance, some exception that even if you put some data in it, in it, it's still kind of not as a rich description of what went wrong than what you have in spec. So that, I think the going forward is going to be a huge thing with what things like we can do. And also, in a sense, for those of you who have common list background, I think it moves closer, close, closer to the um, restart, condition restart system we have in common list because now you can have much more richer information what to do when something goes wrong and you can act on that. And again, it's something that I feel is going to take some time that we actually grasp all the consequences of what this brings to the table. Now, um, why, like I said, okay, we're putting mostly spec at the API boundaries. And this is why you want to do this and like, um, have a lot of it is that also it, it, it's not just uh, to assure that kind of you have valid input and stuff like that, even just with, um, within your own libraries where you don't have to sort of worry about the input or inputs have already been sanitized. The, a big win for me is that what then happens is that actually you fail fast, faster in terms of that um, the error actually happens at the point where you made the mistake rather closer to that point rather than somewhere very deep down the stack. Now we all know that closure exceptions are kind of a, let's say, acquired taste and take some time to kind of be getting used to and the situation is massively improved if you're kind of diligent with where you put this validation because the thing is going to kind of explode at that moment. And that's especially important if you are a big user of either nil punning or multiple arities. Now, like, I love both of them and I love having curried versions of my functions and so forth. So, also, like, if you look at our, the libraries we're using, we oftentimes will have a curried version alongside the, the full argument version. So, a very common mistake that then happens, especially like with people get new to the code base, is that they would mess up the number of arguments or something like that or wouldn't do, um, wouldn't do a current version when they needed it. And using a schema for validation is a great way that here just kind of is kind of in, your, in your face shouts this is a problem rather than having some kind of obscure error with something not being an ISAC, blah, 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 which is it always like even when like I've been doing closures since 2009 and I consider myself relatively proficient, but it still takes some, kind of, some brain cycles that you figure out, okay, what went wrong? It's not immediate. While with spec, what happens is that you have a very clear description what went wrong and as we'll also kind of see we can actually even enhance the error messages that we get and all this kind of immensely helps with just figuring out what's going on. Um, so the, this is something that's kind of relatively new. It's, I think it came out in alpha 12 or even alpha 13 that we now can, can have your own explanations for the error. So basically you can define a function which um, as input gets what went with the kind of the data description of the error you had and then you can use it to produce any sort of error message. And this is our great thing. Like, again, the error reporting situation in Clojure is not really ideal, especially if you look at something like Rust or Elm, which are like light years away from us in terms of how user friendly they are. But this is, kind of, this is the infrastructure that we need in order to build things like that. Now, we already had great success with just kind of figuring out what were the most common modes of error and having 
messages crafted specifically for that, like, oh, did you forget to carry that? Did you forget the last argument? Things like the most common cases, and they, again, Im immensely help, especially new people coming on board with the, the code base. Now, sadly here there are some limitations in the current version. I'm hoping this is going to kind of improve going forward because we're st still talking about an alpha software. But right now you only have, w you can only define basically one explanation function for all. So this kind of limits how much you can do and if you kind of want to have more libraries which would add their own explanations, the whole thing becomes very messy very quickly. And also you don't get the information about which spec actually explodes. So just know what the error was, but you don't know which spec, which again kind of complicates things. Because if at least we had information about which spec, then you could we could use something like multi-methods and have a completely extensible error description system. But right now this is not the case. But uh, as I said, this is something that just came out. I'm really hoping that with kind of people coming forward, uh, forth with various use cases, that this is the thing that kind of I can see being added and will greatly enhance the usability. And also, like, the last kind of point uh, about the, those error messages, which really want to drive home how important thing they are, is that we can now actually build a database of errors and we have kind of actually rich data to do this. So then also kind of going forward, if you imagine just kind of pulling those things together and what, kind of what were resolutions of those problems, maybe tiny to with kind of changes in your version code or something like that, we can actually kind of have a very profound understanding of, kind of what the mistakes were on the level of code and even maybe build systems on top of that which would kind of already suggest some common so solutions and fixes and stuff like that. You know, you know that's kind of joke where someone made an error handler where no matter what exception it just kind of pointed you to stack overflow? Something like that rather just understanding what the actual thing is rather than just letting stack overflow do all the thinking. Right. So moving on. Um, the, the structuring is Maybe like one of those kind of unexpected things because most people when talking about spec, it's all about validation and batch generation and so forth. But actually, in day-to-day -day programming, also the structuring adds a lot in terms of how flexible now closure becomes in working with data. And we were already talking about one of the most powerful languages when it comes to manipulating data, and spec here adds a quite a significant amount. Basically, what it essentially allows you to do is to pull apart any kind of data structure you have and name the parts that kind of combine it. And this is, a, if you have a kind of more complex structures, this is a very big improvement over vanilla destructuring or something like that because then oftentimes when you have different structures, you then have to do some destructuring and then do dispatch based on the what you got out and then the next destructuring and so forth and you end up with a kind of nested mess of destructuring and ifs and so forth, while if you do it with spec, it you know, first of all remove all this logic from the code that's actually manipulating the, uh, the uh, um, you, you remove, you separate the um, transformation from the uh, description of the data or unifying the data and that kind of clears up things and you don't need as much nesting because it's basically the spec that does most of that for you. And also like what I found in practice is that spec plays very nice with both kind of for simple cases the case mark macro and for kind of more involved matching also core dot match. Like at first I thought that actually just like um spec is going to source is more or less going to supplant a core match. And uh, this is actually a question I posed to David some time back and he's like, no, I think they both have to exist. And now I've kind of using it more I understand the logic behind this that yes actually you do still um, w one core match for things like once the, what you get out of um, spec, the kind of conformed value, meaning the the pulled apart and named um, version that you get, you then maybe want to use um, pattern matching on top of that, and that kind of both the both two together provide very um, concise solutions. Um, and it's also like in its and on the other hand, it does solve the kind of the, for me, the biggest um, gripe with a core match, which is the kind of very, or quite awkward when you have, want to use guards, meaning if you want to use kind of an arbitrary function in match, that becomes, it's not very elegant, and here in spec, it's uh, completely kind of natural to use any arbitrary function in your um, description of data, so this kind of also solves this nicely. And but yeah, th this notion of kind of separating your data description from transformation, I think, is kind of very important for the way we tend to solve problems in 
computer science in general, especially like in Lisp like languages, because it kind of allows you again to separate problem into smaller pieces. You don't have to conflate how I kind of transform data into a shape which I know how to solve and actually solving it, and you can have those two separate with just the transformation being encoded in the spec and then your function just act acting on the kind of the ideal, the canonical form of your data. Now here, allow me kind of a short digression because this is like one of the things I kind of love thinking about. And this is a notion coming from Richard Gabriel, which is one of the old school Lisp hackers. And it's about kind of the, he calls it two schools of thinking. And basically his um, idea is that fundamentally how we approach problem solving with computers can be done kind of in two ways. One is the language paradigm, where we first set out this kind of rigid system, almost axiomatic system, where um, we then bounce what we do and then build a solution within it. And the other one is the system paradigm, where we actually acknowledge that we are interacting with some real world or even real life system. And what we do is we kind of slowly build up a solution based on our interactions with that system. So essentially, it's like the system paradigm is um, as you go, you build, you experiment, you try, while the language paradigm is more of a sort of upfront, um, rigorous way where if you, kind of, you have to do all your thinking upfront and then just kind of, uh, <laughs> reap the benefits of your thinking. Uh, I, uh, one way of looking at this was like this um, dichotomy between discovery on one hand and invention on the other hand, where the system paradigm is very much of a question of discovering something while the language paradigm is more in the domain of um, invention. And like, I think that Lisps traditionally work kind of in the system paradigm, but also like with um, spec, I think an interesting, interesting blurring of lines is, um, is starting to show. I just kind of uh, to really reiterate because it's something I'm going to return back to a couple of times with kind of the point of, this, of the system paradigm uh, is that we can nibble at the problem in different directions and have kind of small partial solutions which we then take together and kind of assemble into the final solution. And here this is why I think this spec is so kind of important because it allows us to even better decompose our problem into smaller bits and pieces and then put those together. And this is like the thing with simplifying is that um, it's, you don't have to think at some, about so many things. It's kind of, you can hold more things in your, hand, in your head if they are simple and then kind of build those, just kind of how they interact rather than having something kind of doing, having to do two or three things at the same time. Now, the interesting thing here obviously is like, where does spec tie into this? Because now I was, already, was explaining it from the perspective of a system paradigm where it allows us more decoupling. But on the other hand, it is also kind of a, at least a pseudo type system, which is very much emblematic of um, having kind of a language paradigm. And this is, I think, this interesting position. It also opens the question of when do you write the spec? Is spec something that you write up front, like you would if you were um, doing more or less type oriented programming? Or is something you do afterwards when you already have a solution? And I don't have a clear answer to that. Like, I know that I've started to write more and more spec at the beginning, but I'm not sure that it's not just sort of oscillating between kind of two extremes and not really finding my group. So then I would love to hear kind of your thoughts for those of you who work with spec on that um, afterwards. Right, so, um, the other thing we're talking about transformations of data is kind of going even one step further. This is data macros. And this is a term I stole from the Jux guys who wrote about this in a blog post, which kind of deeply influenced me. And the idea is that kind of we can do, we should, we should think about transforming data right, in the same way that we think about transforming our code, meaning kind of, kind of defined recursive transformations which end up with this canonical form which we know how to operate on. And in, with closure spec, you can do this with um, the conformer function. Um, and the, the nice thing about this, right, the, the power behind um, data macros is that it allows you to do more without code macros, which I don't know, it's kind of sounds uh, paradoxical, and like we are Lispers, we should be using macros, but like what you find is that, that more and more people are kind of turning against this idea of doing as much as like all the things with macros, because it does um, introduce certain problems, like composability always takes a hit when you have a lot of macros, it's just harder to kind of put all these things together, so there's a lot of value in, in trying to 
keep away from macros as much as possible, rather having very simple macros which just remove the boilerplate while the rest you try to kind of express with just data structures. Um, and again, here having something like uh, this kind of data macros is very helpful because it sim simplifies the logic. If due to their recursive nature, you can start with um, the, the smallest bit and then transform it up, while in the other way, if you have just like a function which takes any form of data and tries to transform it, you then have to kind of start thinking from the other direction and basically go from the top down, which in, is usually kind of more error prone and more verbose. So just going to give you an example of kind of like what I'm talking about is, um, I, this is kind of a sort of like a filter but slightly smarter from a library to do for working with data that I wrote. And what we want is kind of a pretty powerful uh, filtering facility. So we want various things like um, having uh, value literals, having the ability to just kind of do current versions and also kind of uh, say something about several, uh, pre um, several predicates or attributes at once. And this is something that's kind of, what at the end we want, we need to arrive is what you see below. Um, and but this is something that you don't, like in terms of API, you don't want to write this out um, manually. So the, basically the options are either you write a macro, or in this case, you can also do all those things with just kind of trans starting with the map you see above and then doing kind of recursively transforming it from the leaves up and you end up with what you need here is kind of a, this canonical version which holds all the information you then need to actually make it work. Um, and like, so the, this is all the, all the code that it takes to do this with just with specs. So we kind of define for each of those, um, each part of our um, query form meaning the, kind of the left and the right side, we kind of defined how this ties together. Uh, now, I, I won't kind of go overly into this. There's like a bunch of um, tutorials about how you use spec online, which probably are kind of more pedagogical than what this kind of setting allows. But it's just kind of to give you an idea what I'm talking about and also that it doesn't really take much code and it greatly simplifies the rest of the code. Um, and also, like a, a nice thing with spec is it kind of mostly uses keywords um, as identifiers, which also means that you don't have to worry about um, sequencing of how you, of your definitions, which again is kind of convenient. Now, the uh, probably the um, biggest selling point of spec is kind of. Uh, or rather, how most people first see the value of spec is that it allows you, it allows you to generate tests automatically and do property-based testing. Um, and like property-based testing in general is something we should be striving for because it kind of forces you to be way more careful with how you write your, your, your code because otherwise if you just kind of write the uh, normal tests. What can often happen is that if you don't really think hard enough about what you're testing, there are obviously case, um, edge cases that you might miss while kind of generative testing or property based testing is usually thorough enough that it finds sort of edge cases that you might not have thought about. And it's also here an interesting like, question for me is how to even do testing when working in the list. Like, I, I know it's going to kind of be maybe controversial, but I'm really not a proponent of doing test driven development when uh, working in a language which has a very strong kind of uh, REPL culture to it. Because I think that it, obviously, yes, tests are something you want to have, but it's sort of something that you kind of write afterwards to ensure um, correctness and so forth and, it, and ease refactoring. But whilst actually finding a solution, I think that they, again, like the moment you start talking about test-driven development, you are essentially talking about kind of language-driven design. You already box yourself in to this solution which you mock with tests or kind of presume with tests. While if you do it kind of purely from the REPL perspective, I think it kind of the finding a solution flows much more organically and you can defer kind of decisions, for instance, what kind of to encode in data and what encode in functions much later. And in the end, I think it kind of leads to cleaner code sooner. But um, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain this is going to be a, a very controversial thing. Um, but I think we can all agree that property-based testing is kind of a powerful tool. So like, 
Our experience with it were kind of just what spec gives you over the kind of vanilla uh, generative testing you get in Clojure anyway. It's kind of mixed back. On the one hand, like when it works, it's amazing, but there are also some limitations, at least like for our cases. Like the two big limitations are one is if you are working with sequences which have some internal structure, let's say a time series, or maybe a time series which also has some periodic component or something like that to it. Uh, this is kind of tedious to, de to describe this with a kind of a spec rather de defined generators, and in the end it just kind of doesn't make sense to stuff all this into spec. So this is one area where we didn't find the spec to be a good fit for what we're doing. And the other problem is, or limitation is um, if you have very generic high order functions, because then it's kind of hard to figure out what the function is going to get in, uh, is going to be, and again, you either test for a very limited subset or just something that's not really feasible. Well, something I was very surprised with was um, that actually how effective this is at uh, generative testing, how effective it is in finding numerical instabilities in uh, kind of Mathemat uh, in numerical, uh, numerically heavy code. Um, now, like, how many of you know what numerical instabilities are? Like, uh, some, okay. Uh, the, the, the problem is that, like, if we are working with um, float points and things like that, or numbers with limited precision, it might happen that we start to multiply or something that's kind of is going to blow up in terms of how large or how small a number we can represent. And kind of then, what happens is that either we get completely nonsense results, or at least we're going to get vastly fluctuating, and neither of those is something that you want. So, um, in effect, that what this means is that you sometimes have to be careful with how you code your algorithms to avoid this. Um, and it's something that, in kind of, when someone says this, it's like obvious and yes, of course, but in practice, what turns out is that we just kind of you don't always think about it. Um, Deep enough. Sure, you kind of look at when you see kind of multiplications and divisions, like mm, will this work? But there are often times like kind of edge cases which you just don't consider. And turns out that generative testing is kind of rather good at finding those edge cases, like for us. And it'll be just like us being shit at writing numerical code, but like it found three three bugs that we actually had in production that um, fall out of the, this testing. So this was like a huge surprise, and we've now invested some more time and effort into really. Um, Shoring up our um, the testing we do, just looking for various numerical stabilities. Like this is something that's sometimes kind of hard to test for uh, because how do you detect that something is stable? So sometimes you do have to kind of do some math and figure out like what your upper and lower bounds are and things like that. But kind of luckily here, uh, um, spec has this. Um, Ability that when you instrument functions, you can also you can say what do you expect your result to be, and also how do you expect your result to be connected with your arguments, and like uh, doing things like making sure that various mathematical invariants hold uh, is a great example of where you want to use this kind of uh, coupling of your inputs and outputs. And the last thing that's also kind of a good trick is that you can use um, exercise, which is the spec way of just spewing out data that. Um, conforms to the shape you've described for mocking. So instead of just kind of having one fixed um, mock uh, data that you work against or just do it manually, you can actually just describe how your data looks and then use that and just you get out of it, first of all, fresh data which, and also kind of more, um, usually uh, more varied data uh, which can already uncover some problems and it was just, uh, if you would be using spec anyway, it's just, Saves you time, not having to do two things at one, two things. Rather, just have the spec and then let the spec figure it out. Um, now, now moving to more kind of things that weren't maybe um, intended uh, at the beginning when spec came out, but something that kind of we found to be of great use of. Although this is something that we've already been doing before with um, schema, but like spec does add some nice things to it. And this is queryable data descriptions. Now, like I said. Um, a big part of the, our closure code base is, has to do with just shuffling data around and doing all the kind of various um, ETL, meaning and extract, transform, load tasks. Um, and here, you often like want to know or understand that kind of, what kind of data you're working with, and spec is a great way to just kind of describe how your data looks like in a very declarative way, and then you can build tools around it and start using this kind of greatly simplified our entire. Operations side of how we work with data, and then like 
just having those descriptions is pretty sweet, but you can go one step further. And what you can do is then kind of stuff them into a graph. So basically, you build a graph out of all the specs and connect how various, for instance, if you have several, let's say, data tables, and which tend to have joins between them. So effectively, they are both contain the same field. And this is something that can be rather nicely expressed in a graph where you see that like, both of those tables are connected with the same node being a certain field. And once you have this kind of description of all your data in a graph, you can do various squaring on top of it, and it becomes a very powerful building block. Not like the, the only, both in terms, a building block both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of just generating documentation and online help and things like that. Like the, the only here sad limitation is that currently you, you can't also stuff inline docs into a spec, which would be nice because then you can really have a complete online, basically, documentation built entirely from this description of your data. Um, but again, like, it's one of those cases of uh, the system paradigm wearing its head where we have what's essentially a type system, with, with, but with one with which we can interact. So it's the type system here is not something that's um, removed from you and basically just available to your compiler, but rather it's a part of your runtime with which you can interact with and build on top of. And that's, like, for me, the essence of system paradigm, that there, kind of, there is no clear delineation between your, your runtime environment and your actual kind of work code or the problem-solving part, but there's kind of one, uh, just a part of a continuous uh, uh, interval. Right, so how, in, how these data descriptions um, help us is that uh, what we do is like we use a lot of materialized views. Now, uh, the idea with a materialized view is that um, you maybe want to do some kind of transformations on your data and put into, into some shape and have that stored because you use that often. Um, why would you want to do this? Is first of all just kind of remove as much duplication in terms of how you prepare your data so you have it once in this, in this kind of canonical shape. And the other argument is that, uh, reason is that if you are um, kind of clever with how you build your materialized views, what you can do is <coughs> greatly improve how much of processing you can then do just on your laptop rather than having to do something in a, you know, a grid or something. And that's a thing that's like, if you talk to most data scientists, they can say that they vastly pre prefer working um, on their own computer rather than having to use Spark or whatever. So it's kind of a, it, a, it speeds up development and simplifies it and also lowers barrier to entries, which we we'll kind of find important. So, but the problem with materialized views is obviously that you then need to um, manage them and make sure that they are up to date. And oftentimes what happens is that you have a lot of materialized views, but just not the one you need them. Like, all of them are almost correct, or almost correct for what you need, but none of them is a perfect match, so you end up with raw data. And here, um, having queryable descriptions of your data is greatly helpful, because what we can then do is we can actually produce materialized views completely automatically just based on inference. So what we do is we have some kind of ontology defined both in terms of um, spec and uh, some of it just based on types and some of it on kind of domain things, for instance, okay, this is a user ID or whatever. And then you can do kind of, then define various rules on top of that. For instance, like every time you see a data, a data stream coming in which has a field called user, also create this derived view which um, in, enhances this data with also some historical data about, for instance, like, how, is this a new user or an old user or what the cohort is, the segment, or whatever you want to do. And you, by just having like a completely uh, data-driven description of this, you don't have to actually manage this automatically. You just have the rules, and then the system does this on its own. And the other thing we are doing, although this is, doesn't, schema, uh, spec doesn't really help with this, is also do kind of various statistical analysis on our data to see if, for instance, if there is a strong seasonal component, then we'll also kind of group the data into um, sensible time chunks and have various aggregates in that. And this is something that has kind of greatly simplified how our entire analytics stack works, and I'm kind of pretty excited about what more we can build on top of, because like, the whole, this idea of stuffing your spec into a graph is relatively new. That's also why I have, we haven't released anything yet, but it's definitely something that I think could be a, 
a good contribution to the closure ecosystem, but it, right now it's, um, it's, it's very promising in terms of what you can do. Right, so um, I just kind of love this slide, so I stole it completely shamelessly. Uh, and just kind of, I think that right now we're at the stage where spec really nailed the kind of the simple part, um, but there are some things still kind of not maybe as easy as they could be. So, like, the one thing I almost immediately do is just define a couple of quick macros which help solve almost kind of some of the common cases. This is also due to especially because maybe I'm a big user of spec in ways that weren't initially may maybe the focus of design, meaning doing various kind of as a data macros and uh, destructuring, which get this to solve. Um, so it's kind of helps. But I, I'm not really certain if this is the idiomatic way of going forward. And like, this is kind of the last thing I want to talk about is just like, how do we proceed with this? Like, it's clear that spec is something kind of amazing, but I think what we right now need to do is we need to kind of start a discussion what idiomatic usage of spec means. Now, there are always going to be kind of some weird usages of spec, and that's fantastic, but I think we should also have kind of this understanding of, we should also eight new people coming on board and using spec of how do you start using it. And it's going kind to of start with even like this very basic things, like for instance, um, should specs be in line with your code or somewhere completely separate? Which one do you choose? Like, the, these things I think that we as a community should kind of eventually settle on, just have some good practices and arguments what to, do, what to do and what not. And also like the other thing I was talking about, when to spec, is spec something right up front or at the end? Now, all of those are obviously due to personal preference, but I think it's something that's worth having a discussion about because it may kind of lead to some reflections that otherwise might go past. And obviously there's kind of this huge area open to with spec in terms of the tooling, which right now is just kind of not really taking advantage of all the things that spec brings about. So I'm certainly hoping that in let's say a year's time we're going to be listening to various talks about how people are leveraging spec just to build more powerful tools, more powerful environments in which you can actually then solve your problems. And there are also interesting things like um, Ambrose is doing a project where it's kind of um, using, uh, which is kind of um, meshing a typed, a typed closure with spec, which is another interesting approach to sort of gener using the generative capabilities to then arrive at the, um, type descriptions and so forth. So there's like, a lot of interesting things going on and um, I'm really excited about all the, other, all the things that are going to bubble up in the coming months and years. So um, with this in mind, I yield the floor to you, and if any questions and comments, I'd like to um, hear your options on it.